very much for coming. I think this is going to be a really fun panel. We have uh, some fascinating people on stage, and uh, what I'd like to do is, is have a wide-ranging conversation for 30 to 40 minutes about a number of topics, but loosely um, uh, organized around the future of mobile. And, um, and then we're going to take audience questions for at least 20 minutes and maybe even a little longer. So if you have things that you'd like to, to ask the panelists, uh, think about it now. Um, also notice we have execs from, well, in the room or on stage, we have execs from Microsoft, Facebook, Google, some other companies. So maybe we can bring them into the conversation at some point as well. Maybe. <laughs> Last night I saw I saw Shel Sandberg, uh, who's here. Uh, he's the your president of Facebook. Is that right? Yeah. CEO. Yeah. She walked into the to the, the hotel we're all staying in with um, Reed Hoffman from LinkedIn. And uh, I assume it was, you have a pained look on your face, but this is, I said, uh, that makes a post right there, Facebook and LinkedIn may be doing a merger, but anyway, I, apparently that's not happening, so. Uh, let, I'd like to introduce, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to introduce our panelists, um, starting uh, uh, from the end down here. Uh, Hamid Akhavan is the CEO of T-Mobile International. Uh, professor, professor Eric Clemens is uh, the Professor of Operations and Information Management at the Wharton School. And I've been running to him all week and uh, knocking heads, so I, I know he has some interesting <coughs> things to say today. Uh, Chad Hurley, uh, to my right, is the co-founder and CEO of, of YouTube, uh, which is now a subsidiary of Google. Um, that acquisition was at the end of 2006. Uh, my name is Mike Harrington. I write a blog called TechCrunch. I'm actually the least interesting person on stage, um, so I'll keep my talking to a minimum. Uh, to my left is Craig Mundy, the Chief Research uh, and Strategy Officer at Microsoft. To his left is Shantanu Narayan, the president of Adobe. And Mark Zuckerberg's on this panel. We have the founder and CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, on the far left, wearing a tie for the first time I've, I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever had a tie on before today? Yeah. Graduation? All, all of 2009 and when I went to boarding school. Okay. <laughs> but I noticed you covered, up, you covered it up with the... Uh, no, the I, I always wear <laughs> <laughs> So let's start off by um, have framing... Pardon? Let's start off by framing the conversation. Um, sometime recently, it, about a billion people, uh, we reached the billion people online mark, at least according to Comscore. Um, and obviously that's, that's a lot of people. But it pales in comparison to the number of people who have mobile phones of some sort in their hands. Um, and I sort of talk a little bit about you know, what the mobile landscape uh, looks like today. So Hamid, can you tell us, I mean obviously you, have these, you probably know these numbers offhand, how many people have mobile phones today? What kinds of phones do they have? And what their capabilities are? Yeah, I mean, uh, mo mobile phones, clearly more than 3 billion people, about 3.2 or 3.3 billion people have mobile phones today. Number expanding very rapidly in a couple of years across the 4 billion mark. Uh, it's the, the most widely held electronic device uh, of any kind. Uh, but a small portion of that, uh, less than uh, you know, 5% or about 5% of that, are devices that are 100% browser ready and browser capable. So those are the ones we call super smartphones at the high end, which are uh, optimal for internet experience. Nonetheless, with that small population of, uh, of phones relative to the big, uh, you know, big base of phones, uh, the traffic is rising, the mobile data traffic is rising, which says people are online. Uh, what you're saying, uh, for instance, in, in Western <coughs> Europe, where we have a good portion of these phones, we see um, a fourfold increase in traffic every 12 months, at least, maybe more. So in data traffic. In data traffic. It's, it's growing geometrically. Um, and uh, all of this is still what I call scratching the surface. You know, we haven't gotten to uh, the, 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 the middle part of the S-curve yet. We're just at the very beginning. Um, and uh, this part, the, uh, the smartphone segment, is also growing very rapidly. Uh, but I think the proportion is still is going to be a smaller portion, you know, about 10 or 15 percent of the total phones, even in the next two to three years. What are the data rates that people, um, the average person has in Europe, Asia, Africa, in different continents? You know, the mobile data networks are upgrading and becoming more uh, capable uh, on an ongoing basis. Every few months, we generally upgrade the network to higher speed. So the average rate changes, but the user in Europe can easily now have a one megabit per second on a, on a sustained basis, which is okay. something that um, even a few years ago, was considered a very good broadband experience. Today, we consider basic broadband experience of one megabit per second on a small screen mobile phone. That is very useful because you're not displaying HDTV. You're having a QVGA screen, maybe yeah. a half QVGA screen, but um, still uh, 
Is there a secret code that will get you on any T-Mobile <coughs> Wi-Fi hotspot in the world? There probably yes, is. Right? Yes, there is, and um, I will privately sell that after the show. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, um, you have, a, 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 this might be exaggerating, but I wrote a post recently saying that a one in five internet users are on Facebook today based on Comscore numbers showing you have 200 million uniques worldwide uh, in the yeah, hands of December. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever that number is. How important is, that obviously doesn't take into account mobile, how important is mobile to you with your sort of nascent products that you offer today? How many people are logging on to Facebook uh, via mobile devices today? So mobile is obviously, it's, it's really important because the whole point of what we're trying to do is make it so people can share more information with the people around them, right, and, and just surface more information that way. So um, in the past, you know, people have uploaded large forms of content like a whole photo album or written a whole blog post, and increasingly people are taking a mobile photo right, and uploading it right then or constantly posting updates right from their phone. So it enables more sharing because people have the device with them all the time. So um, and right now we have around... 25 million people who are actively using the, the mobile applications, and um, and that's one of the areas that's growing the most quickly. And, you know, I mean, in, in a lot of the countries where Facebook is widely used, it's one of the most trafficked um, mobile websites. So it's it's already you know something that's, that's pretty widely used, um, a small portion of Facebook users, but growing pretty rapidly. And you know, and as the mobile platforms develop and, and become more standard, we're, that's obviously going to be an area where we're going to focus a lot as well. What is your biggest mobile platform? Is it the iPhone? In terms of uh, downloads usage, I actually don't know that off the top of my head. It's um, I mean, I, I think that there are a few that are really big. BlackBerry is really big. iPhone is really big. And then I mean, a lot of people just um use mobile web and SMS. <coughs> Craig, from your perspective, whether you know as a representative of Microsoft or just being a super smart guy, where where are we going with mobile and mobile social networking, and how important is the fact that these devices have presence location that you know, can be transferred back to the to the network? I think location-based services broadly are going to be a big factor. They haven't really matured very much because there haven't been that many devices uh, that, that intrinsically have the capability and sometimes where the, the knowledge is available through the carriers or the, the, the network operators, they don't uh, generally make it available. But I think you know, that'll change one way or the other over time, particularly as the devices become more intrinsically sort of GPS or GPS plus enabled. I, I think there'll be uh, a lot more integration of that into the applications uh, than there has been today. It, it, it's a bit disjointed right now. Uh, but I think that that will become a, a more and more important part. Why, why aren't they integrated? Is it, it, is it a technical issue or is it privacy concerns about people's location being transmitted, you know, maybe no, to the... I think that it's just you're too early in the cycle. There haven't, there's no uniform way in which people get at those capabilities even within the devices. You, you know, each platform has its own way that it surfaces some of these things. And I think uh, as that becomes a bit more standardized, and there's just more of them out there, then I think you'll see the people who write the apps will naturally move to exploit it more, just like they do every other facility in the device. I mean, be, you know, when there were very few cameras in the phones not that many years yeah. ago, there wasn't that much photo integration into things. I mean, it was really hard to take a photo on your phone and then get it out or move yeah. it anywhere. And now, you know, you can click the photo and move it to an app. I think it's just a natural process of evolution. Um, Professor Clemens, what, what do you think about all this? I th I, first thing, this is fantastic. I, mean, I always start by asking, what if there were no limits? And then I explore the future. And when I started writing about business process outsourcing <coughs> in 1991, I stayed so far out ahead of the curve that I couldn't get anything published for five years. What I find interesting is the stuff that I was figuring is unimplementable due to the young men all around me, is not so far out anymore. This is the only field that's evolved faster than futurists can write about it. It's just tremendous. I think one of the things, if you ask, what if there were no limits? Every human being with unlimited bandwidth walks into a bar and is instantly as smart as my dog. You know, my dog would walk in and go, and say, oh, that dog likes me. Oh, but that dog came in with that dog, and he's real jealous. And, but I can, I can take him, oh, but that's his dad, and I can't take him, and, oh, but I got two friends over there. You know, the dog just, if you watch a dog walk into a room, he knows more than any of us. And, and my, my, I'm going to, my, 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 my good friend, Jared Lanier, who, who started a lot of the early work in virtual reality, 
and virtual reality is so last year. What you want is augmented reality. You want to walk into a room and see instantly who's on your side, who would be interesting, who you need to talk to, who's recently downloaded your stuff, whose stuff you've just stolen, and just sort of instantly understand the social setting, the context entirely around you. Now what's interesting about that is my daughter does this better than I do. I'm probably the only guy on the faculty who published three papers last year with 19-year-old co-authors. And that's because if you really want to know what's happening, you ask the, the guys who use it. And if you want one word dot connected, and then I'll, I'll, I'll sit back. One of the things that's fascinating to me is the impact this has had on organizational structure. We've all watched World War II movies in which the beleaguered captain tells his corporal, get division on the phone, and the guy cranks, and he says, I need air cover, or I need artillery. And we all you know, thought the general was really a terrible old man, but he was the only guy who had access to data from everyone and the ability to command down. My freshmen can call a meeting faster than the dean. My freshmen have access to, to information faster than my university president. And we did surveys of different age groups. 25-year-olds still have some respect for their uh, organization. 40-year-olds actually believe what the organization tells them. 18-year-olds have loyalty that they call basically, you know, the cool word five years ago was posse. But it's fascinating to have uh, Lehman and Goldman, not Lehman anymore, uh, pick two survivor banks bidding on the same contract in direct opposition, and the CEOs do not realize that the teams doing the work are actually coordinating via Facebook because they're old college roommates. So the entire nature of the organization, the hierarchy, the nature of loyalty, the nature of organizational structure, is changed as soon as I walk into the room and I instantly know everybody. Did that connect with that? Yeah, that's great. All right for an old man? All right. It was much better than yesterday. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Chad. You wanted it from Chad, not me. Oh, he's, you're an old man, too. <laughs> okay, well, that's the last time I'm going to call on you. Um, Shantanu, Adobe, Flash, what's the future? When am I going to be able to uh, run it on my iPhone or whatever device I'm testing that week? Um, it's obviously, Flash in particular, has made tremendous inroads on, on the desktop machines, but you just don't see it online. Um, for different reasons. Doesn't run, Flash video doesn't run well on ARM, ARM chips, which run a lot of the mobile devices. Um, maybe it's not a focus for you guys. Where, where do you see this going? Because, you know, you think about virtual worlds and social networking, Flash could play a, a, big, a big part in that. Well, Adobe, we certainly believe that the whole multi-screen experience for applications is going to be absolutely critical, whether they be social networking applications or whether they be video applications. And we're actually really focused on making sure that Flash works exactly the same on all those devices. Uh, we've shipped only a billion devices that have Flash on them. Uh, in Japan, virtually no phone can you get today that doesn't have Flash and everything there, whether it's 3G video or all the other services through Docomo World. And we're clearly seeing that we still have tremendous fragmentation as it relates to mobile devices, but I think the industry will step up and we will solve that problem. Uh, we're working on Android, we're working on Windows Mobile, it actually ships with them, and Symbian. So it's very much part of our strategy to be able to offer once and to be able to pay back with the fidelity that you expect across all of these devices. Can I ask the audience, um, if you have a smartphone, what, so if you have a smartphone, could you raise your hand? Oh, yeah. Okay, so everyone. Uh, if you were on a uh, Microsoft-driven device, raise your hand. Okay, if you're on a Symbian operating system, iPhone. Wow, that's a very Silicon Valley answer. Um, uh, what's the one that you guys have? Android. Android? Anything else? Oh, Blackberry. Anybody have a Blackberry? Yeah. <laughs> Ergo fragmentation, right? Uh, Chad, I remember um, you came to a party at my house. Couple months after you launched YouTube, and I remember asking you. I'm so envious. Um, I remember asking you. So this YouTube thing, like videos, people are putting like videos of like fire trucks and stuff up, and um, 
lot of copyrighted content at the time. I said, that, it, what do you, do you think it's going to work out? And I remember, uh, I remember you saying, I don't know, we'll see, how, we'll see where it goes. So I guess, first of all, how did that work out? <laughs> <laughs> We're still working on it. We still feel there's a long way to go. Because, well, you said a billion people online now. Yeah. Half about a third of them. Uh, so we need another two thirds to come to our side. But, uh, uh, you know, specific to the mobile market, um, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, we're here at the, in Davos and there's a lot of doom and gloom, and I think you know, within the technology sector there's a lot of upside, um, and in particular in the mobile market, um, mobile services, mobile applications. And uh, what we've been seeing, uh, just by serving videos on some of the limited devices that now can handle video, um, from the iPhone to the G1, um, that it's actually on a percentage basis growing faster than our site itself. That more people are consuming videos at a faster rate on their cell phones. And uh, I think that will only increase as the devices and the connectivity uh, increases. Far more interesting for me than watching video on my device, which you know, I mean, it's a great way to pass the time, and YouTube is on the iPhone, um, but is uploading video to YouTube directly from a device. And we're <coughs> starting to see some of the applications come out. Uh, when will we see that really become common, where I'll be recording video and uploading it to YouTube all day, all the time? Yeah. Well, it's available on some devices, and most of those devices you still have to connect to your, your computer to, to actually upload the file. We do have limited mobile uploading capability, but the file sizes are limited, and the videos don't look that great because the cameras aren't uh, very good. Uh, but again, as the devices improve and as the, the connections increase, uh, it'll become a, a larger part of, of what we're all about. Because you mentioned the, the type of videos that we do get, there's going to be many more people on the street uh, with a cell phone, with a digital camera, than are going to be professional uh, networks or studios with cameras developing their own content. People are going to be sharing their own experiences, their own thoughts and ideas, and they're going to be doing, be, being able to do it instantly. So, uh, a bright future in terms of uploads. You, how, how much content is uploaded to YouTube? Now? You guys usually talk about per, per minute. Per minute. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so currently we uh, receive over 15 hours of video content every minute on our site. Um, and it continues to increase. And we've also recently increased the, uh, the, the, the file size, the, the resolution which we're displaying videos. So we have HD 720 uh, display, and uh, so the market is here in terms of people taking HD video. We feel we have the largest library of HD video on the internet at this point, um, in terms of catalog size. And uh, you know, not only the video uh, HD video the content increasing, the views increasing, um, just participation per, in terms of what people are finding, in terms of how what they're looking for. They are looking for higher quality content. Uh, we always tried to divide, design a service that was easy to use. We reduced the quality of the video so it would stream seamlessly. Yeah. Um, but we're seeing some people have, have either have the, have the patience or they have the connections to be able to consume this at the, the quality it should be. What percentage of that 15 hours is copyright violated? Um, you know, it's a, it's a small percentage. Because, like I mentioned before, the, uh, the majority of the people within our system have the, the tools, the cameras, and the capabilities to take their own videos. Uh, but really for us, it's a non-issue. We've developed the, the technologies, the content ID systems for content owners to give them maximum choice uh, on how they want to use content within our system. And what we're finding is the majority of the content owners are leaving their, their content on the site to monetize it. Or 90% of the partners or people using our tools are leaving content on YouTube. Craig, how important is mobile to Microsoft? Well, it's super important. You know, our view going forward is we kind of think of the three screen strategy. There's the big, three big screen that's sort of entertainment focused like television. There's the traditional computer side screen, desktop, laptop, and there's the little screen, which is your phone. And you know, our view is that what people need next is to have some rational relationship among the three screens, some more you know, easy to use way of coordinating what they do across them. And so even though you know our, our bread and butter was originally in the desktop, you know, we've pushed upward into the television and gaming experience at one end. You know, we've been in, in the mobile phone software business for quite some time, and I'd say it's, it's one of the strategic imperatives for the company. What do you think of Professor Clemens' idea of, um, I guess we'll call it the dog sniffing future, where you can uh, walk into a room and get all kinds of metadata about the people and things going on in there with your mobile, mobile device? How far away are we from something like that? Well, I think that will continue, and I, and I agree with him that over time, more and more uh, 
uh, <coughs> augmentation of the things that you want to know will be there. I mean, you know, many people said, you know, uh, they, they just can't wait for something that will, you know, recognize faces and remind them who those people are that, that they know they've seen, they just can't remember their name. And, you know, the real question is, how do you interface the, the computer to the person in a way that's socially acceptable? And even that is interesting to, to speculate on. If you, if you would have asked most people, you know, if you just arrived from outer space a few years ago and said, hey, how often would you see people wandering around this silver thing hanging on their ear? You know, they would have said, mm, that would be pretty weird. But, you know, Bluetooth uh, devices, they become more and more commonplace and accepted. So, you know, what, whether the thing turns out to be eyeglasses, you know, that, that turn out to have retinal projectors in them or something. I mean, it's hard to know how you're going to get the data. Do you guys have that kind of stuff in, in Microsoft, like in the labs? Yeah. The retinal projectors? And yeah, we have all those things. Do you have yeah. one on right now? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I wish I did. <laughs> the, uh, and of course, that is, of course, the way you would do it. You wouldn't need face recognition. Your phone would know from my phone uh, that you've met me before, and you would... Uh, yeah, but what Craig is talking about is how it gets that information into your brain. Well, you know, well, he doesn't want to bother looking at a screen. I want that's why they have this. Well, I don't know. Maybe you just have the direct input. You know, I mean, we had a meeting with the MIT people yesterday who were talking about this going the other way, where they, they now actually can put a small implant in to help people who, who've lost limbs control prosthetic arms and things. And, you know, it, it turns out it isn't that hard to actually think that it goes the other way. Yeah. So, you know, you just have to decide that at what level you think that you know, the man-machine interface evolves to it. There's certainly no technological reason now to believe, even in my lifetime, that that, that, that type of direct communication between the, the, the devices that you, you know, have, you know, on your person uh, uh, won't ultimately be in your person. And, you know, th then the, the division is harder to find. <clears throat> All right, do we have any questions from the audience? Nothing? Privacy, you want to talk about, yeah, I think privacy is a good topic to yeah, talk about. Because talk about. I, I, tried to, I tried to drag you guys into that, but uh, both Craig and, and, and Mark, we didn't, you didn't go there, so let's, I'll be more direct about it. It, it is my opinion that uh, <coughs> privacy plays a big role in, in limiting and slowing down the rollout of mobile services. Um, I have heard off-record, not from you, Mark, but off-record people at Facebook and at MySpace talk about concerns with attorneys general in the United States. Uh, there have been so many issues with social networking in general that have involved the, the Attorney General with privacy that the last thing uh, that the last thing the big social networks want is to um, is to have them come after them again because of uh, location information flowing to other users and things like that. That has to be. I mean, you sort of didn't answer that question, but that has to be an issue that you guys think about just policy-wise uh, when you think about mobile social networking. So there are definitely a lot of really interesting services that that can be new. Right, in, in this environment. So I'm gonna, I talked about a couple, right? Just being able to post a photo from your phone, um, post updates about what you're doing now, like status updates and things like that. And that's revealing and sharing types of information that people didn't even think about sharing five years ago, right? It's just what I'm doing right now, what's going on. So it's not that far of a stretch from that to get to, I want to share with the people around me what my location is, right? Or be able to identify who the people are around me. But yeah. privacy is a really important part of that. And it's always been a really core part of what Facebook does because giving people the controls so that they can say, I want to share this piece of information with these people is what makes it so that people feel comfortable doing it, right? So even from the beginning of, of Facebook, we made it so that you, know, you weren't sharing your profile with everyone on the site, even when it was only a few colleges. You know, you're sharing it with your friends and the people around you at your college if you wanted. Right now, there are more than 150 million people on the site, but you're sharing your information with you know, maybe the, the few hundred or a hundred that you're friends with, and if you want to share, say, your cell phone number with an even smaller number, then you could do that. And okay. that, that's what makes it so people are comfortable sharing. But you, don't let, share their but you don't let everyone. people share their location yet. And we know that that's possible because there, there are services like Looped and I think BrightKite and probably a dozen others that are mobile social networks that sort of focus on where you're located and then the people around you and what they're doing. Uh, I think that's actually because of some of the other issues that we've been talking about, which are that the platforms haven't been standardized yet. Right? So I mean, a company like Facebook is still a relatively small company. Right? We're, we're working on a lot of different things. And you know, with all the different mobile platforms, with iPhone, BlackBerry, Android, um, mobile web, just uh, all the new ones that are coming out, it would be very difficult at, um, at, at, at this scale to be developing applications for all these different services uh, and, and platforms. So I mean, one of the big things that we're looking forward to 
and I think is going to spur massive innovation across the whole industry, is when the number of platforms consolidates and when you know that you can develop things from maybe one or two platforms and reach all of the different phones. Right? That's going to be a really powerful thing. But I think um, that and the fact that GPS isn't really available on all phones um, are, sure. are the things that make it that that's not available. I think that the privacy issues, that actually ends up being pretty simple. You give people complete control over how they share their information. Right? And when you do that, people kind of can, over time, get comfortable sharing what they want to. Um, and if you don't, then no one will use it. Uh, I'd like to add a few thoughts. Seven or eight years ago, well before these became popular questions related to the online services or the search businesses, um, you know, we realized that the, this whole question of trust was going to be essential to people's continued uptake. And so we created a thing called the Trustworthy Computing Initiative at Microsoft, which focused both on security, privacy, and a number of other things. The thing that we ultimately determined to answer the latest question directly is, that, and, and Mark alluded to it too, is that what people need is, is notice and choice. And it's pretty much universally true that if you give people notice of what you're collecting and you give them some choice as to what the disposition of that data or uses are, then there really are, are virtually no privacy issues that emerge. And so that concept has guided a lot of what Microsoft has done. Uh, while you know, most people today, I'd say, are focused a little bit too much on the data, and the idea that you know data collection and data retention is sort of intrinsically bad. You know, I'll give you the counter example. You know, we we have Health Vault, which is a place now where people put it you know, as a private repository of their health data. And it turns out you don't want us to get rid of it every 90 days. All right. In fact, you want people to have a permanent repository of health data and in very controlled ways allow it to participate. You know, in in the research for you know uh, cures for for diseases and other things and. Ultimately, you may even want to be told, you know, that, that when something new is known, you know, that, that you'd like to be informed as it relates to your personal medical condition. So I think it's it's going to be important that we evolve this discussion, you know, beyond the question of what got collected. Was it location data? Was it medical data? Was it, you know, behavioral uh, targeting uh, data for, for advertising? Um, and and understand that, that the, te the technology is going to result in us collecting and remembering a huge amount of data. And over time, we, we ultimately find beneficial ways. People can certainly speculate that there are uh, evil ways, you know, to use and exploit data. And the question, I think, is going to become one of how can we find a, a manageable way for people to declare their intent about each class of data and each class of service that they subscribe to. To the extent that we can get that agreed on, uh, and, and that becomes platformized, so that you know you're not, you know, facing a hundred different ways to, to express that intent, then I think that these issues will will come under control. There are definite <laughs> business tensions because some, you know it's easy to build certain business models that presume that you you have almost a surreptitious collection of information, and of course governments, you know, their intelligence businesses that that's what they do for a living. So at, at some level, you have to realize that, that the world is going to be a sea of data. And the real question related to privacy is, you know, how does the user get to specify you know, what they think their ownership rights are in that data, no matter who collected it? Uh, and I think these are questions that are not clear in the law and not clear in policy, and that that's really got to be the focus of a lot of the, the discussion. But I think it would be dangerous, actually, if we allowed a lot of regulation to dictate what happens over the internet as it relates to this, because I think the rise of social networks have proven that the desire to be part of a community, you know, trumps in many cases of concern that people have about their privacy or data. And so I think they're going to force every uh, one of these companies to self-police as well, in addition to you know, the laws that will emerge. Well, but I think this, this privacy issue actually is a very paramount issue in terms of the future services. I, I like to position it as probably one of the most difficult issues we challenge we are, we are facing today in terms of developing new services. Um, yes, there's a lot of data, but there's uh, not only legal, but also ethical um, rules that we have to follow. Um, Location-based service is a good example. You know, there's probably an infinite level of permission rights that you could design, at the, uh, you know, going from as, as easy as um, whoever is in the, any neighborhood will get an offer from the local restaurant without, without having any information about who is there all the way down to having your friends and family in the vicinity have a 
the icon come on their address book saying that you are within 50 meters of them, but they don't want to meet with you. You know, so and there's a whole host in between. Um, the, the, the problem is that today there is no way uh, that forward in terms of defining these levels and no way to define to, to talk to the customers and consumers and, and get their permissions in a legal way and ethical way. So we actually see that as a very huge issue we should, we should, we should be grappling with. Can I build on that first commend you on that? I don't think uh, it's, it's correct to say we don't need regulation. What we really don't need is the wrong regulation. Uh, I, I would be very reluctant to use some of the social networks I'm comfortable with if I thought my colleagues had access uh, to what I was doing. Not to put too fine a point on it, I had family members who I would never want to know I was within 50 miles or 50 feet <laughs> because I am not going to look them up and why fight over it? And um, so, they, so I think what you're actually saying is, is correct. You need the platform that will enable me to uh, decide what I want. And you need the regulators to say if, if the user has given informed consent, uh, then you, there are no privacy issues. But if the user has given uh, restrictions, as Mark is suggesting, and those restrictions have been violated, in the example you were using, I happen to want my health records online, and that's because I'm lucky enough not to have any health conditions that I would really not want my employer or my wife to know about. But if I had some remarkably uh, socially rude conditions, I would never want that information to leak. So the idea of regulation, the technology platform, and user choice is the, is the magic combination. I don't think Mark would, would put it this way, but um, <coughs> One thing I like about Facebook is that it's always been ready, fire, aim. And if you look at the news feed, you guys have always pushed the envelope with new products. And almost every time you launch something, you have an uprising on Facebook over the product, which usually dies down a couple of days later. And news feed is the one that I think is fascinating. Because when did you launch that? The end of yeah, six. Time? Yeah, I think September or six. Yeah. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, what news feed is, is basically anything you do on Facebook goes into a stream of news about you, and your friends can see it depending on your privacy settings. And people just went crazy over it, uh, some people to start. But now, not only do people accept it, but um, I think that they, they really like it. And I think the service has been duplicated by most of the social networks. So one of the things you've told me in the past, Mark, is that, is that you're surprised at how fast culture is evolving towards people not only being willing to give up more private information in exchange for utility, um, but like actively looking to do that. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that I was saying just a moment ago with when I was saying that I thought that location-based services weren't that big of a stretch from some of the status activity that was happening on the site. But you can go back to the beginning of Facebook where people basically just put up a very small amount of information about themselves, their name, the community they were a part of, some interests, one photo, that was it. Right then over time, people started sharing more things, right? All the groups that they were a part of, all photo albums, um, lots of different stuff like that. And now it's getting into really real-time stuff, right? Like constant messaging, right? Constant status updates. Um, yeah. And I, I also that, things you do on third-party sites. Yes, I mean, that was the whole point Watching of the platform, right? Making it that people can share all different types of information, whether inside or outside of Facebook. And, um, you know, I think what's happening is people are just getting comfortable sharing more and more, <laughs> not just because, uh, the main reason for that is that it's valuable, right? It's, I mean, when you put up a, a photo album, a lot of the reasons why you're, why, you're, um, why you're taking photos is that you can share them with people, right? I mean, you were there, you know what happened, right? So. Um, so all the stuff, I and mean, people, by sharing you know, where you are at a time, um, for example, you might make it so that you can meet up with people who are around you, right? or um, get advice on what you might want to do in a place. Right? Um, I mean, sometimes when I travel to New York, for example, I went there right before I came here, um, said I was in New York, I got like, all these messages with things that were going on. I didn't realize it was one of my friend's birthdays that night, and like, I was like, oh, it's my birthday. I should go to, you should come to my party. Right? So it actually is very useful to share this type of information, it creates a lot of efficiency within, within society. So um, I, I think that's one of the things that's always been a core principle of Facebook is that the world, we want to push people to be able to share more and more information because we think that quickly people are going to evolve to use these new technologies to want to do that. So that's why we did things like Newsfeed, um, which now, as you mentioned, a lot of other companies have replicated, why we did things like Platform, yeah. um, and why I think some of this mobile stuff is going to be really important. We had a question back here. Um, I'm sorry, depending on the panel, I'm pushing into the ignorance. If you have a panel called Quantify, Mobile, 
the demographics of who's using what and who isn't using um, the mobile content at all, and particularly in terms of age groups. And then related to that, if there are any new applications or any particular things which are managing to get the older, perhaps um, less frequent mobile content users engaged. Um, I can give you uh, start to the answer. I'm sure we can chime in. Um, clearly, uh, the younger segment of the population, <coughs> anywhere from 15 year to 30 year old range, um, has the highest usage of mobile data and social networking services, and uh, the ones who are showing the most affinity towards new innovation, and new data services. Um, I want to use this opportunity to also say something uh, regarding um, sharing and, and social networking using mobile and privacy, which we, we were just wrapping up. Um, we actually, I actually see that the world is dividing in two categories of people, the ones who are becoming more, uh, more open to publishing themselves, like uh, you know, people on Facebook and others who actually YouTube, they, they like to publish themselves, they're putting everything out there. And there's a, a, a large group of people, and I don't want to say it, it's the great majority, but clearly a large group of people who are going exactly the other way, who are trying to protect themselves against all of these bombarded information that's coming to them, that is unsolicited, and they're just actually not uh, enjoying it, and actually becoming a bit more um, afraid of losing privacy without having uh, given <coughs> consent. So um, th this is the group that is a challenge for all of us in order to offer new services to without without uh, making them nervous about their privacy and the uh, impact on their lifestyle. But uh, clearly, as the age goes up, you could see that the affinity towards new services, social networking, mobile data, and innovation goes down. That, that's clear. The sweet spot, 15 to 30, 35 year old is the sweet spot. You actually hit something absolutely essential. There's a huge difference between push and pull. If someone pushes an ad at me or a product recommendation or a restaurant, and I can't even use my phone for what I want because I'm getting bombarded, um, that's the wrong model. If anything I want, if I, if I want to know what my friends, where my friends eat when they're in Chicago, and I pull that in, that's enormously useful. So it's not that uh, us old guys uh, are hiding from data, we're hiding from push. Now that's fine for any one of us who's not in the advertising business. Uh, but if you're a media seller, a media buyer, or you are the creative of an advertising agency, you've got an interesting problem. I'll, I'll add one other thing. I think there actually is another, from an application point of view, demographic group, which is people who whose first real use of these smarter phones was for email. I mean, I'm going to do a poll in the audience. Okay, how many people in the audience do email on their smartphone? 100%. You know, of, of the people who raised their hand, how many people used some other application on their phone before they used email on their phone? Does a text message on my phone? No, not kind of text. I'm saying when you, when you got up to the smartphone category, you know, you weren't, you weren't just voice and SMS, you know, what was the first app? I would say, you know, almost everybody you'll find their first app was mail. So I think that that, that, that there's a, the people who started using these the more advanced things first, you know, with the BlackBerry and Windows Mobile and other things. All the focus in those things was essentially integration into the email systems. And then that essentially moved into the public email systems. And, you know, uh, and, and I think that these two worlds are sort of converging. You know, you're starting with people who uh, are young, they, they see a, a diverse set of applications that they can run these things, they integrate them into these other environments, and they're growing up that way. I think you'd see that there's a, you know, a very, very large community of people whose 